world headquarters of common sense. Talk radio. That's NHS waiting list. Um, Sajid Javid uh, basically broke the bad news to us yesterday in the House of Commons about just how bad those waiting lists are, how much worse they're going to get. Six million now could be up to 10 million or more in the next couple of years and what he's going to do about it. So, first of all, how did we get into a situation where one in nine people in, in, in England are, are, are waiting for health care? Well, you're absolutely right that Sajid, the health secretary, was totally open about this. He's been open about it before, and I think when he's been on media rounds, when he's been um, uh, standing at the dispatch box in the House of Commons since he was made health secretary, he's been very open about the hidden demand that could come back into those waiting lists. So we've got a waiting list of six million. That's gone up from where it was before the pandemic by give or take, around 2 million. Um, That's a reflection of the measures that were taken during the pandemic in terms of hospitals not being able to perform as many normal procedures and people not coming forward for a variety of um, reasons. But there's eight and a half million people, we estimate, who normally would have come forward who haven't. Now, they won't all necessarily come forward, but we've got to plan for that, which is why in this plan we set out yesterday, we set out what we think is an ambitious but realistic trajectory to start bringing those waiting lists down and help people um, get the treatment they need to tackle both the pain and, let's be honest, the anxiety they'll be feeling if they're waiting for, say, a diagnostic test. Well, indeed, I think a lot of people might question how ambitious it is when we're talking about uh, uh, waiting lists carrying on going up to 2024. But as you say, realistic, have we got the staff to uh, and the facilities to actually tackle that? You mentioned there people not coming forward for a variety of reasons. Well, we know what those reasons were. People were terrified out of their minds by adverts that told them, effectively, you know, the plague's going to kill them if they step out of their home. They were told that their job was to protect the NHS rather than the NHS to protect them. They weren't able to make a doctor's appointment. They were told not to go to A&E. They were told not to bother their doctors. And so people, what a surprise, didn't. Um, doesn't the, doesn't the, the government, with its messaging, and frankly the NHS leadership as well, don't they have some responsibility for this, that when you turn the National health service into the national covid service understandable perhaps in the beginning of march or mid-march but not understandable by mid-april when they would already have realized what that was going to mean don't they actually have responsibility for this no i think julia the nhs was under huge pressure as you know both in that first wave and later on in the year there were a number of measures that had to be put in place firstly there had to be the capacity in the nhs for clinicians to treat those with the most urgent illness. And COVID, when people someone was admitted to hospital with COVID, they were very seriously ill. So there had to be the capacity to treat those people who came in in that emergency situation, which meant some electives, a large number of electives, had to be postponed as a result of that. Cancer care, certainly in subsequent waves, was kept going. um, I've spoken spoken to widowers whose wives, you know, in their 30s with young children... We're told their cancer care was cancelled. I'm sorry, what the cancer specialist is not treating COVID patients. On, you, on, on you didn't let me finish what I was saying, which is they kept cancer care going as the, far as they could while managing that um, that capacity challenge and those demands on the um, on the hospitals. I think we're now at around 99.7% activity levels in terms of cancer treatment of pre-pandemic levels. But other measures in hospitals also significantly reduced the ability to do... Okay routine treatments and elective treatments, which were for things, for example, like um, infection prevention control measures, the voided beds to avoid people transmitting the virus, which meant you had a reduced bed base to treat people. You also had staff um, focused on treating both COVID, but also off sick with COVID in many cases. So you've seen a whole range of factors coming together, then- which have added to this weight and has created this 2 million um, addition to the waiting list with, I suspect, I'll be honest with you, more to come. Indeed, but that's look, why there are, there are lots of issues. Then, then the government compounded this by, by threatening for a long period of time to sack anybody who hadn't been jabbed, large number of staff, sacking NH, sorry, social care workers, which meant that we've now got something like, according to you know the NHS providers, something like 10% of hospital beds currently being used up by that awful phrase, bed blockers, people who should be in social care but can't be because those care homes haven't got enough staff. A lot of these problems are created, they're predicted, they're they're predictable, and yet we're constantly dealing with them as if they're a complete surprise, like we do with winter every year. So three three points there, Julian. I'll try and answer them all very uh, quickly. Um, first one, discharges and getting people out of hospital. You're right that getting people out of hospital safely discharged home or to a care home is hugely important. But there are a variety of reasons why 
discharges are delayed and less than half of those discharge delays are down to social care and a lack of a social care setting to to discharge people to workforce you're absolutely right about its importance these are people who've worked flat out during the pandemic they're also the people who are going to help um, bring those waiting lists down and that's one of the reasons why since 2010 we see 30,000 more doctors in our NHS, 38,000 more nurses in our NHS. Take it from just last year, uh, sorry, 2020 to 2021, 11,000 more nurses, 5,000 more doctors. So we're growing that workforce well, in parallel. So we've got a plan for that. And your final point about um, vaccination. Um, I believe, and I continue to believe, that the policy on the base of the evidence of the alpha and the delta variant and the effectiveness of the vaccine, both against infection and against hospitalisation and serious disease meant that that balance, and it's quite rightly a high balance if you're going to mandate vaccination, was the right one that first do no harm, protect those vulnerable patients. What we did, which was totally honest and transparent, is when that evidence changed with the Omicron variant, the Secretary of State came to Parliament and said the evidence base has changed. That changes the balance. Vaccination is still the best way out of this pandemic. It's still a professional responsibility. But that bar for mandation is not met. And he quite rightly came to the House and changed that policy. Okay. Um, th there's so much more I want to ask you. I know our time is very precious. So just a final question to you. Uh, Prime Minister's got PMQs today after the uh, mob uh, basically abusing Keir Starmer. Prime Minister has been accused of, of stirring up that mob. Should and will the Prime Minister make an apology to uh, Keir Starmer today? I mean, language, we all know language has consequences. You are a broadcaster every day. Um, you will choose carefully. I think your phrase is um, ruthless but fair, but you will <laughs> choose your language um, carefully. We all need to reflect on the language we use. But the Prime Minister, I think, let's be clear, the Prime Minister has clarified his comments. They were not personal. They were not personally directed at Sir Keir Starmer. They were him directing them at the conduct of someone or, or the office that was held and the organisation that uh, was being referred to. Just as quite rightly, Keir holds the Prime Minister to account for the government, even when he's not involved directly in individual decisions. I think what the Prime Minister made very clear when he clarified this was that he was referring to um, the DPP office and the organisation rather than Keir personally. OK, I'm not sure it was that clear, but there we are. Health Minister Ed Argo, really appreciate you. Good talk. Hot talk. talk. Bold talk. Talk radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk radio.